Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Storytime with Moog. I am Moog, and today we are reading Through the Glo Today <laughs> we are reading Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found by Lewis Carroll. But first, reading updates. I am reading Yellow Face by R.F. Kwong. Sorry I don't have the book physically in my hands. I left it in the other room because I am, like I said I was going to do, I am reading it outside of reading sprints. I said it was going to happen, and it did. And just like that, the book magically appeared. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive, right? <laughs> so yes, I am reading Yellow Face by R.F. Kwong. Um, it's really good. Um, this is her, at least that I know of, her first dip into just strictly fiction. Um, she's most noted for like fantasy writings. Um, I'm really enjoying it. I'm on page 194 thus far. And it is about um, this writer who has a writer friend and the friend is way, way, way <laughs> more popular than she is. Like she's a better writer just in general, but she's also like had really good book deals and she is making more money on like her work and her book was picked up for Netflix, all of these things. And so those two um are out celebrating. They go back to the apartment. Um she talks the friend talks a little bit about this manuscript that she wrote that she just finished earlier that day and she's very excited about it. Um she doesn't talk to anybody about her writing process or anything um as she's working on it. Um so she's really excited to share it with with her editor and see where it goes. So the two of them are eating pancakes as one does at the end of celebrating and they're having a pancake eating contest and the friend chokes and dies and so we are left to you know call the police deal with everything like that we go back home we're so distraught but in our bag is the manuscript and it only gets wilder from there why is it called yellow face because the friend was uh born in china and has done a lot of work like writing for or with about all of those things um chinese americans and also just like people from china and the book focuses on uh chinese laborers during world war one and so we being the narrator strategically rewriting things and making it seem like it's our work and that sort of thing. It's very good. I am enjoying it. And it is just so interesting how like it started as a writing, uh, like a writing challenge almost to fill in the gaps that her friend left to just, you know, rationalizing every decision that we've made. And it has snowballed into chaos <laughs> and i'm excited to see where it's gonna go from here so that was yellow face by rf kwong i hope to finish it this week we'll see we'll see we'll see as always we'll see <laughs> and i think that's all i'm currently reading so very good i will be returning it to the library very soon <laughs> But today we are reading more Alice. We are going to be starting Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There by Lewis Carroll. And I'm so excited because in the second part we are getting new characters that everybody already knows but aren't in Alice's adventures in Wonderland, like Tweedledee, to Tweedledum, um, Jabberwocky, like all of these fun things. So, shall we? Are we cozy? Are we comfy? Oh, and also, just one more chapter. <laughs> I know I say that on a daily basis. <laughs> Let's, oh, before we start, so this one is also short, like Alice's Adventure in Wonderland. So we're going to read about 50% today, um, and then we will finish next time. That's the plan. All right. Ooh, I need one more sip. One more. 
Ooh, there's a preface. Okay. Let's read the preface. Had I known that both the preface of Through the Looking Glass and Alice's Adventures were Christmas time, I might have read this for Christmas time. I didn't know that these were Christmas books. How silly of me. <laughs> All right. Preface to the 1896 edition. As the chess problem, given on the previous page, has puzzled some of my readers, it may be well to explain that it is correctly worked out so far as the moves are concerned. The alternation of red and white is perhaps not so strictly obvious as it may, might be, and the castling of the three queens is merely a way of saying that they entered the palace. But the check of the white king at move six, the capture of the red knight at move seven, and the final checkmate of the red king will be found by anyone who will take the trouble to set the pieces and play the moves as directed to be strictly in accordance by the laws of the game. And let me show you where the... They don't show the picture until after the preface, but here is the chess picture. The new words in the poem Jabberwocky have given rise to some differences of opinions as to their pronunciation, so it may be well to give instructions on that point also. Pronounce slithy as if it were two words, sly the, okay. Sly the, there we go. <laughs> Make the G hard in gyre and gimbal and pronounce wrath to rhyme with bath. Okay, so the way that gyre is spelled is G-Y-R-E and then the way wrath is spelled is R A. Th. For this 61st thousand, fresh electrotypes have been taken from the woodblocks, which, never having been used for printing from, are in as good condition as when first cut in 1871, and the whole book has been set up afresh with new type. If the artistic qualities of this reissue fall short in any particular, of those possessed by the original issue, it will not be for want of painstaking on the part of author, publisher, or printer. I take this opportunity of announcing that the nursery Alice, hitherto priced at four shillings net, is now to be had on the same terms as the ordinary shilling picture books, although I feel sure that it is in every quality except the text itself in which I am not qualified to pronounce. Great superior, greatly superior to them. Four shillings was a perfectly reasonable price to charge, considering the very heavy initial outlay I had incurred. Still, as the public have practically said, we will not give more than a shilling for a picture book, however artistically got up. I am content to reckon my outlay on the book as so much dead loss and rather than let the little ones, for whom it was written, to go without. I am selling it at a price which is, to me, much the same thing as giving it away. That is dated Christmas 1896. Interesting that Lewis comments on the price of the book. That's interesting. I've never seen that before. To be like, I know what you're, I hear, I hear your pleas and your cries. It's interesting. <laughs> All right. So now we have the picture of the chessboard, which I just showed, but here we are. Introduction. Child of the pure, unclouded brow and dreaming eyes of wonder. Through time be fleet, and I and thou are half a life asunder. Thy, living, thy loving smile were surely hail, the love gift of a fairy tale. I have not seen thy sunny face, 
nor heard thy silver laughter. No thought of me shall find a place in thy young life's hereafter. Enough that now thou wilt not fail to listen to my fairy tale. A tale begun in other days, when summer suns were glowing, a simple chime that served to time the rhythm of our rowing, whose echoes live in memory yet, though envious years would say, forget. Come, hearken then, ere voice of dread, with bitter tidings laden, shall summon to unwelcome bed. A melancholy maiden, we are but older children, dear, who fret to find our bend time near. Without the frost, the blinding snow, the storm wind's moody madness, within the firelight's ruddy glow, and childhood's nest of gladness. The magic words shall hold thee fast, thou shalt not heed the raving blast. And though the shadow of a sigh may tremble through the story, for happy summer days gone by, and vanished summer glory, it shall not touch with breath of bale the pleasance of our fairy tale. Chapter One Looking Glass House One thing was certain, that the white kitten had had nothing to do with it. It was the black kitten's fault entirely, for the white kitten had been having its face washed by the old cat for the last quarter of an hour, and bearing it pretty well, considering. So you see that it couldn't have had any hand in the mischief. The way Dinah washed her children's faces was this. Dinah, that's Alice's cat, that we know of from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. The way Dinah washed her children's face was this. First, she held the poor thing down by its ears with one paw, and then with the other paw she rubbed its face all over, the wrong way, beginning at the nose, and just now, as I said, she was hard at work on the white kitten, which was lying quite still and trying to purr, no doubt feeling that it was all meant for its good. But the black kitten had been finished with earlier in the afternoon, and so, while Alice was sitting curled up in a corner of the great armchair, half talking to herself and half asleep, the kitten had been having a grand game of romps with the ball of worsted Alice had been trying to wind up and had been rolling it up and down till it had all come undone again. And there it was, spread over the hearth rug, all knots and tangles, with the kitten running after its own tail in the middle. Okay, so Alice is like rolling up a ball of yarn, and the cat is playing with it, and unraveled it all. Oh, you wicked, wicked thing! cried Alice, catching up the kitten, and giving it a little kiss to make it understand that it was in disgrace. Really, Dinah ought to have taught you better manners. You ought, Dinah, you know that you ought, she added, looking reproachfully at the old cat, and speaking in a cross voice, as she could manage. And then she scrambled back into the armchair, taking the kitten and the worsted with her, and began winding up the ball again. But she didn't get on very fast, as she was talking all the time, sometimes to the kitten and sometimes to herself. Kitty sat very demurely on her knee, pretending to watch the progress of the winding, and now and then putting out one paw and gently touching the ball, as if it would be glad to help if it might. "'Do you know what tomorrow is, Kitty?' Alice began. You'd have guessed if you'd been up in the window with me. Only Dinah was making you tidy, so you couldn't. I was watching the boys getting in sticks for the bonfire, and it wants plenty of sticks, Kitty. Oh, it got so cold, and it snowed so, they had to leave off. Never mind, Kitty, we'll go and see the bonfire tomorrow. Here Alice wound two or three turns of the worsted round the Kitty's neck, just to see how it would look. This led to a scramble, in which the ball rolled down upon the floor, and yards and yards of it got unwound again. "'Do you know I was so angry, Kitty?' 
Alice went on, as soon as they were comfortably settled again, when I saw all the mischief you had been doing. I was very nearly opening the window and putting you out into the snow. And you'd have deserved it, you mischievous darling. But have you got to say for yourself? Now don't interrupt me, she went on, holding up one finger. I'm going to tell you all your faults. Number one. You squeaked twice while Dinah was washing your face this morning. Now you can't deny it, Kitty. I heard you. What's that say? Pretending that the Kitty was talking. Her paw went into your eye. Well, that's your fault for keeping your eyes open. If you'd shut them tight, you wouldn't have happened. Now, don't make any more excuses, but listen. Number two. Now, you pulled Snowdrop away by the tail just as I had put down the saucer of milk before her. What, you were thirsty, were you? How do you know she wasn't thirsty, too? Now for number three. You unwound every bit of the worsted while I wasn't looking. That's three faults, Kitty, and you've not been punished for any of them yet. You know, I've been saving up all your punishments for Wednesday week. Suppose they had suppose they had saved up all my punishments, she went on, talking more to herself then to the kitten. Um, Wednesday week, meaning exactly one week from Wednesday. And we have pictures. We have one of the cat playing with the ball of yarn, and then Alice scolding Kitty on the chair. What would they do at the end of the year? I should be sent to prison, I suppose, when the day came, or... Let me see. Suppose each punishment was to be going without a dinner, then when the miserable day came, I should have to go without fifty dinners at once. Well, I shouldn't mind that much. I'd far rather go without them than eat them. Do you hear the snow against the window panes, Kitty? How nice and soft it sounds, just as if someone was kissing the window all over outside. I wonder if the snow loves the trees and fields, that it kisses them so gently. And then it covers them up snug, you know, with a white quilt. And perhaps it says, go to sleep, darlings, till the summer comes again. And then, when they wake up in the summer, Kitty, they dress themselves in all green and dance about whenever the wind blows. Oh, that's so very pretty, Alice cried, dropping the ball of worsted to clap her hands. And I do so wish it were true. I'm sure the woods look sleepy in the autumn when the leaves are getting brown. Kitty, can you play chess? Now don't smile, my dear. I'm asking it seriously. Because when we were playing just now, you watched just as if you understood it. And when I said check, you purred. Well, it was a nice check. Kitty... And really, I might have won if I hadn't been for that nasty night that came wriggling down among my pieces. Kitty, dear, let's pretend. And here, I wish I could tell you half the things Alice used to say, beginning with the phrase, let's pretend. She had had quite a long argument with her sister only the day before, all because Alice had begun with, let's pretend we're kings and queens. And her sister who liked being the exact, who liked being very exact, had argued that they couldn't, because there were only two of them, and Alice had been reduced to say, well, you can be one of them then, and I'll be the rest. And once she had really, and once she had really frightened her old nurse by shouting suddenly in her ear, nurse, do let's pretend that I'm a hungry hyena and you are a bone. Excuse me. But this is taking us away from Alice's speech to the kitten. Let's pretend that you're the Red Queen, Kitty. Do you know? I like... I think if you sat up and folded your arms, you'd look exactly like her. Now do try. There's a dear. And Alice got the Red Queen off the table and set it up before the kitten as a model for it to imitate. However, the thing didn't succeed principally. Alice said, because the kitten wouldn't fold its arms properly. So, to punish it, she held it up to the looking-glass that it might see how sulky it was. And if you're not good directly, she added, I'll put you through into looking-glass house. How would you like that? Now, 
if you'll only attend, Kitty, and not talk so much, I'll tell you all my ideas about Looking Glass House. First, there's the room you can see through the glass. That's just the same as our drawing room, only the things go the other way. I can see all of it when I get on my chair, all but the bit that just behind the fireplace. Oh, I do so wish that I could see that bit. I want so much to know whether they've a fire in the winter. You never can tell, you know, unless our fire smokes and then smoke comes up in that room too. But that may be only pretense, just to make it look as if they had a fire. Well then, the books are something like our books, only the words go the wrong way. I know that because I've held one up, one of our books up to the glass, and then they hold up one of the other books. How would you like to live in Looking, Gla Looking Glass House, Kitty? I wonder if they'd give you milk in there. Perhaps Looking Glass milk isn't good to drink. But, oh, Kitty, now you come to the passage. You can just see a little peep of the passage in Looking Glass House. If you leave the door of our drawing room wide open, and it's very like our passage as far as you can see, only, you know, it may be quite different on beyond. Oh, Kitty, how nice it would be if we could only get through into Looking Glass House. I'm sure it's got, oh, such beautiful things in it. Let's pretend there is a way of getting through into it somehow, Kitty. Let's pretend the glass has got all soft like gauze so that we can get through. Why, it's turning into a sort of mist now, I declare. It'll be easy enough to get through. She was up on the chimney piece while she said this though she hardly knew how she got up there. And certainly the glass was beginning to melt away, just like a bright, silvery mist. In another moment, Alice was through the glass and had jumped lightly down into the looking-glass room. The very first thing she did was to look whether there was a fire in the fireplace, and she was quite pleased to find that there was a real one, blazing away as brightly as the one she had left behind. "'So I shall be as warm here as I was in the old room,' thought Alice. "'Warmer, in fact, because there'll be no one here to scold me away from the fire. Oh, what fun it'll be when they see me through the glass in here and can't get at me!' Then she began looking about, and noticed— that there could be seen from the old room was quite common and uninteresting, but that all the rest was as different as possible. For instance, the pictures on the wall next to the fire seemed to be alive, and the very clock on the chimney-piece, you know you can only see the back of it in the looking-glass, had got the face of a little old man and grinned at her. "'They don't keep this room so tidy as the other,' Alice thought to herself, as she noticed several of the chessmen down in the hearth among the cinders. But in another moment, with a little, oh, of surprise, she was down on her hands and knees watching them. The chessmen were walking about two and two. "'Here are the Red Queen and King,' said Alice, in a whisper for fear of frightening them. "'And there are the White King and the White Queen, sitting on the edge of the shovel. And there are two castles, walking arm in arm. I don't think they can hear me, she went on as she put her head closer down, and I'm nearly sure that they can't see me. I feel somehow as if I were invisible. And here are the pictures of Alice on the mantelpiece and going through the looking glass. Here, something began squeaking on the table behind Alice, and made her turn her head just in time to see one of the white pawns roll over and begin kicking. She watched it with great curiosity to see what would happen next. "'It is the voice of my child,' the White Queen cried out, as she rushed past the king so violently that she knocked him over among the cinders. "'My precious Lily! My imperial kitten!' and she began scrambling wildly up the side of the fender. "'Imperial fiddlestick!' said the king, rubbing his nose, which had been hurt by the fall. He had a right to be a little annoyed with the queen, for he was covered with ashes from head to foot. 
Alice was very anxious to be of use, and, as the poor little Lily was nearly screaming herself into a fit, she hastily picked up the queen and set her on the table by the side of her noisy little daughter. The queen gasped and sat down. The rapid journey through the air had quite taken away her breath, and for a minute or two she could only do but hug the little Lily in silence. As soon as she was recovered her breath a little, she called out to the white king, who was sitting sulkily among the ashes. "'Mind the volcano!' "'What volcano?' said the king, looking up anxiously into the fire, as if he thought that was the most likely place to find one. "'Blew me up!' panted the queen, who was still a little out of breath. "'Mind you come up, the regular way, don't get blown up.' Alice watched the White King as he slowly struggled up from bar to bar, till at last she said, "'Why, you'll be hours and hours getting to the table at that rate. I'd far better help you, hadn't I?' But the King took no notice to, of the question. It was quite clear that he could neither hear her nor see her. So Alice picked him up very gently and lifted him across the more slowly than she had lifted the queen, that she mightn't take his breath away, but before she put him on the table she thought she might as well dust him off a little. He was so covered with ashes. And we have two pictures as well, the pieces, and then the king being lifted up. <laughs> She said afterwards that she had never seen in all her life such a face as the king made, when he found himself held in the air by an invisible hand and being dusted. He was far too much astonished to cry out, but his eyes and his mouth went on getting larger and larger and rounder and rounder, till her hand shook so with laughing that she nearly let him drop upon the floor. "'Oh, please don't make such faces, my dear.' she cried out, quite forgetting that the king couldn't hear her. "'You make me laugh so that I can hardly hold you. And don't keep your mouth so wide open, all the ashes will get into it. There, now, I think you're tidy enough,' she added, as she smoothed his hair and set him upon the table near the queen. The king immediately fell flat on his back and lay perfectly still, and Alice was a little alarmed at what she had done, and went round the room to see if she could find any water to throw over him. However, she could find nothing but a bottle of ink, and when she got back with it she found he had recovered, and he and the queen were talking together in a frightened whisper, so low that Alice could hardly hear what they said. The king was saying, "'I assure you, my dear, I turned cold to the very ends of my whiskers,' to which the queen replied, "'You haven't got any whiskers.' "'The horror of that moment,' the king went on, "'I shall never, never forget.' "'You will, though,' said the queen, "'if you don't make a memorandum of it.' Alice looked on with great interest, as the king took an enormous memorandum book out of his pocket and began writing. A sudden thought struck her, and she took hold of the end of the pencil, which came some way over his shoulder, and began writing for him. The poor king looked puzzled and unhappy, and struggled with a pencil for some time without saying anything, but Alice was too strong for him, and at last he panted out, "'My dear, I really must get a thinner pencil. I can't manage this one a bit. It writes all manner of things that I don't intend.' "'What manner of things?' said the queen, looking over the book, in which Alice had put— the white knight is sliding down the poker. He balances very badly. That's not a memorandum of your feelings. There was a book lying near Alice on the table, and while she sat watching the white king, for she was still a little anxious about him, and had the ink all ready to throw over him in case he fainted again, she turned over the leaves to find some part that she could read. For it's all in some language I don't know she said to herself. It was like this. And it's written backwards. <laughs> That's why. So the writing, which it looks like on the next page, it's written like the right way. But the it's the first stanza of this poem 
and the words themselves are in the sentences are backwards and it looks I, you're not going to be able to see it but it looks uh, uh, just i promise it looks cool i promise <laughs> the the lighting on these pages does not do it justice she puzzled over this for some time but at last a bright thought struck her why it's a looking-glass book of course and if i hold it up to the glass the words will all go the right way again this was the poem that alice read jabberwocky twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave all mimsy were the borogroves and the momy raths outgrabe beware the jabberwock my son the jaws that bite the claws that catch beware the jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch he took his vorpal sword in hand long time the manzome foe he fought so rested he by the tum-tum tree and stood a while in thought and as in uffish thought he stood the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came one two one two and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker snap he left it dead and with its head he went galumping back and hast thou slain the jabberwock come to my arms my beamish boy o frabg frabgious day Kalu Kalay, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillic and the slithy toves did gyre and gimbal in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves and the mome raths outgrabe. And there is a picture next to it. Tis the Jabberwocky. Flee for your lives! <laughs> It seems very pretty, she said when she had finished, but it's rather hard to understand. You see, she didn't like to confess, even to herself, that she couldn't make it out at all. Somehow, it seems to fill my head with ideas, only I don't exactly know what they are. However, somebody killed something, that's clear, at any rate. But, oh— thought Alice, suddenly jumping up. If I don't make haste, I shall have to go back through the looking-glass before I've even seen the rest of the house. Let's have a look at the garden first. She went out of the room in a moment and ran down the stairs, or, at least, it wasn't exactly running, but a new invention for getting downstairs quickly and easily, as Alice said to herself. She just kept the tips of her fingers on the handrail and floated gently down without even touching the stairs with her feet. Then she floated on through the hall and would have gone straight out the door in the same way if she hadn't caught hold of the doorpost. She was getting a little giddy, too, with so much floating in the air, and was rather glad to find herself walking again in the natural way. End of chapter one. All right, so... Chapter one, we have Alice in her study, I guess, in a room with a couple kittens, and she's scolding Kitty for all of the wrongdoing that Kitty has been doing. <laughs> and as she's doing, she's like, well, let's pretend that you are the Red Queen. Like, just fold your arms like this. And of course, Kitty can't do that. And Alice is holding up the kitty to the looking glass, and it's like, Kitty, look at you. You're nothing like the, the Red Queen. And she puts her down and she's like, Oh, Kitty, wouldn't it be wonderful to see what the rest of the room in Looking Glass House looked like? Like, it looks, the parts that we can see look like our room, but reversed. So I'm just wondering, is there a fire in the hearth and what the rest of the house looks like? And so as she's doing this, she somehow climbs on top of the fireplace. <laughs> Even she doesn't know how. And then she's just imagining that the looking glass is a silvery 
moss that she can just walk through. And as she's imagining that that's what it is, that's what happens. And she just walks through. And she is so excited because there is a fire in that room and she's going to be just as warm in the other room, nay, warmer, because there's nobody to tell her that she can't be too close to the fire. And as she's walking around, she hears something and she turns around and she sees the chessboard and there is like a little cry and it's a pawn that had fallen over and there's a king and a queen there and they can't see or hear her. So when Alice is moving the pieces up onto the table they're like what what is happening <laughs> and so the queen is talking to the king these are the white king and queen and white pawn lily is the daughter and the queen is like you need to write this down in your memorandum so he takes out this massive book from his pocket because everybody has and keeps their memorandum in their pocket at all times um, takes it out to write down what's going on and Alice tries to grab the pencil and like write things and she has written you know that the is it the night the night is falling down but he can't read it and so she looks at what's already written and there's a poem but she can't read it because it's all backwards so she puts it up to the mirror and she can read the poem and she's like well this is weird because I have no idea what the, any of this means and it's about the Jabberwocky and so she's like, oh, I need to leave. I need to see what else is going on in this house and the garden and everything before I run out of time. So she leaves and she sort of just like floats down the stairs as one does. And that's where chapter one ended as she wants to go out to the garden. Chapter two. The Garden of Live Flowers. Oh, that's right. In adaptations, in like movies, there's those pansies that talk. And I didn't even realize that that wasn't in Alice's Adventure. Here we are. Here we are, friends. Let's do it. Chapter 2. The Garden of Live Flowers. I could see the garden far better, said Alice to herself. If I could get to the top of that hill, and there's a path that leads straight to it, at least, no, it doesn't do that. After going a few yards along the path and turning several sharp corners, but I suppose it will at last, but how curiously it twists. It's more like a corkscrew than a path. Well, this turn goes to the top of the hill, I suppose. Wait, no, it doesn't. This goes straight back to the house. Well, then, I'll try it the other way. And so she did, wandering up and down and trying turn after turn, but always coming back to the house. Do what she would. Indeed, once, when she turned a corner rather more quickly than usual, she ran against it before she could stop herself. It's no use talking about it. Alice said, looking up at the house and pretending it was arguing with her. I'm not going in again yet. I know I should have, have to get through the looking glass again, by into the old room, and there'd be an end of all my adventures. So, resolutely, turning her back upon the house, she set down once more down the path, determined to keep straight on till she got to the hill. For a few minutes all went on well and she was just saying, I really shall do it this time, when the path gave a sudden twist and shook itself, as she described it afterwards, and the next moment she found herself actually walking in at the door. Oh, it's too bad, she cried. I never saw such a house for getting in the way. Never. However, there was a hill full in sight, so there was nothing to be done but start again. This time, she came upon a large flower bed, with a border of daisies and a willow tree growing in the middle. Oh, Tiger Lily, said Alice, addressing herself to one that was waving gracefully about the wind. I wish you could talk. We can talk, said the Tiger Lily, when there's anybody worth talking to. Alice was so astonished that she couldn't speak for a minute. It quite seemed to take her breath away. 
At length, as the tiger lily only went on waving about, she spoke again, in a timid voice, almost in a whisper. "'And can all flowers talk?' "'As well as you can,' said the tiger lily, "'and a great deal louder.' "'It, it isn't manners for us to begin, you know,' said the rose, "'and I really was wondering when you'd speak,' said I to myself. "'Her face has got some sense in it, though it's not a clever one. "'Still, you're the right colour, and that goes a long way.' "'I don't care about colour, said the tiger lily remarked. "'If only her petals curled up a little more, she'd be all right.' Alice didn't like being criticised, so she began asking questions. "'Aren't you sometimes frightened at being planted out here with nobody to take care of you?' "'There's the tree in the middle,' said the rose. "'What else is it for good for?' "'But what could it do if any danger came?' Alice asked. "'It could bark,' said the rose. "'It said bow wow,' cried a daisy. "'That's why its branches are called boughs.' "'Duh!' "'Didn't you know that?' cried another daisy, and here they all began shouting together, till the air seemed quite full of little shrill voices. "'Silence, every one of you!' cried the tiger lily, waving itself passionately from side to side, and trembling with excitement. "'They know I cannot get at them,' it panted, bending its quivering head towards Alice, "'or they wouldn't dare to do it.' Oh, "'Never mind,' said Alice in a soothing tone, and stooping down to the daisies, who were just beginning again, she whispered, "'If you don't hold your tongues, I'll pick you.' There was silence in a moment and several of the pink daisies turned white. "'That's right,' said the tiger lilies. "'The daisies are worst of all. When one speaks, they all begin together, and it's enough to make one wither to hear the way they go on.' "'How is it you can all talk so nicely?' asked Alice, hoping to get it into a better temper by a compliment. "'I've been in many gardens before, but none of the flowers could talk.' "'Put your hand down and feel the ground,' said the tiger lily. "'Then you'll know why.' Alice did so. "'It's very hard,' she said, "'but I don't see what that has to do with it.' "'In most gardens,' the tiger lily said, "'they make the beds too soft "'so that the flowers are always sleepy.' This sounded a very good reason, and Alice was quite pleased to know it. "'Oh, I never thought of that before,' she said. "'It's my opinion that you don't think at all,' the rose said in a rather severe tone. "'I never saw anybody that looked stupider,' a violet said, so suddenly that Alice quite jumped, for it hadn't spoken before. "'Hold your tongue!' cried the tiger lily. "'As if you ever saw anybody. You keep your head under the leaves and snore away there.' till you know no more what's going on in the world than if you were a bud. Hmm. Are there any more people in the garden besides me? Alice said, not choosing to notice the rose's last remark. There's one other flower in the garden that can move about like you, said the rose. I wonder how you do it. Oh, you're always wondering, said the tiger lily. But she's more bushy than you are. "'Is she like me?' Alice asked eagerly, for the thought crossed her mind. "'There's another little girl in the garden somewhere.' "'Well, she has the same awkward shape as you,' the rose said. "'But she's redder, and her petals are shorter, I think. "'Her petals are done up close, almost like a dahlia,' the tiger lily interrupted. "'Not tumbled about, anyway, like yours.' "'But that's not your fault.' the rose added kindly you are beginning to fade you know and then you one can't help one's petals getting a little untidy alice didn't like this idea at all so to change the subject she asked does she ever come out here i dare say you'll see her soon said the rose she's one of the thorny kind where does she wear the thorns alice asked with her curiosity Why? All 
around her head, of course, said the rose. I was wondering you hadn't got some, too. I thought it was the regular rule. She's coming, cried the spark. I heard her footsteps thump, thump, thump along the gravel way. Alice looked round eagerly and found that it was the Red Queen. She's grown a good deal, was her first remark. She had, indeed. When Alice first found her in the ashes, she had been only three inches high, and here she was, half a head taller than Alice herself. "'It's the fresh air that does it,' said the rose. "'Wonderfully fine air it is out here.' "'I think I'll go and meet her,' said Alice, for, though the flowers were interesting enough, she felt that it would be far grander to talk with a real queen. "'Well, you can't possibly do that.' said the rose. I should advise you to walk the other way. This sounded nonsense to Alice, so she said nothing, but set off at once towards the Red Queen. To her surprise, she lost sight of her in a moment, and found herself walking in at the front door again. A little provoked, she drew back, and after looking everywhere for the Queen, whom she spied out at last a long way off, she thought she would try to plan this time. She would try the plan this time of walking in the opposite direction. It succeeded beautifully. She had been, she had not been walking a minute before she found herself face to face with the Red Queen. And full in sight of the hill she had been so long aiming at. Where do you come from? said the Red Queen. And where are you going? Look up, speak nicely, and don't twiddle your fingers all the time. Alice attended to all these directions, and explained as well as she could that she had lost her way. I don't know what you mean by your way, said the Queen. All the ways about here belong to me. But why did you come out here at all? She added in a kinder voice. Curtsy, while you're thinking what I say, it saves time. Alice wondered a little at this. But she was too much in awe of the queen to disbelieve it. I'll try it when I go home, she thought herself. The next time I'm a little late for dinner. It's time for you to answer now, the queen said, looking at her watch. Open your mouth a little wider when you speak, and always say, Your Majesty. Oh, I only wanted to see what the garden was like, Your Majesty. That's right said the queen, patting her on the head, which Alice didn't like at all. Though when you say garden, I've seen gardens compared with which this would be a wilderness. Alice didn't dare to argue the point, but went on, and I thought I'd try and find my way to the top of that hill. When you say hill, the queen interrupted, I could show you hills in comparison which you'd call that a valley. No, I shouldn't, said Alice, surprised into contradicting her at last. A hill can't be a valley, you know. That would be nonsense. The queen shook her head. You may call it nonsense if you like, she said, but I've heard nonsense, compared with which that would be as sensible as a dictionary. Alice curtsied again, as she was afraid from the queen's tone that she was a little offended, and they walked on in silence till they got to the top of the hill. For some minutes Alice stood without speaking, looking out in all directions over the country, and a most curious country it was. There were a number of tiny little brooks running straight across it from side to side, and the ground between was divided up into squares by a number of little green hedges that reached from brook to brook. I declare it's marked out just like a large chessboard, Alice said at last. There ought to be some men moving about somewhere. Oh, and so there are, she added in a tone of delight, and her heart began to beat quick with excitement as she went on. It's a great huge game of chess that's being played all over the world. If this is the world at all, you know, oh, what fun it is! How I wish I was one of them! I wouldn't mind being a pawn, if only I might join, though of course I would like to be a queen best. Here is 
Alice and the Queen, and that is what she sees, the chessboard all laid out on top of the hill. <laughs> She glanced rather shyly at the, the real queen as she said this, but her comparison only smiled pleasantly and said, "'That's easily managed. You can be the white queen's pawn, if you like, as Lily's too young to play, and you're in the second square to begin with. When you get to the eighth square, you'll be a queen.' Just at that moment, however or other, they began to run." Alice never could quite make out, in thinking it over afterwards, how it was that they all began. All she remembers is that they were running hand in hand, and the queen went so fast that it was all she could do to keep up with her, and still the queen kept crying, Faster! Faster! But Alice felt she could not go faster, though she had no breath left to say so. The most curious part of the thing was, that the trees and other things round them w never changed their place at all. However fast they went, they never seemed to pass anything. I wonder if all the things move along with us, thought poor, puzzled Alice. And the queen seemed to guess her thoughts, for she cried, Faster! Don't try to talk! Not that Alice had any idea of doing that, she felt as if she would never be able to talk again. She was getting so much out of breath. And still the queen cried, Faster! Faster! And dragged her along. Are we nearly there? Alice managed to pant out at last. Nearly there? The queen repeated. Why, we passed it ten minutes ago! Faster! And they ran on for a time in silence, with the wind whistling in Alice's ears, and almost blowing her hair off her head, she fancied. "'Now, now!' cried the queen. "'Faster! Faster!' And they went so fast that at last they seemed to skim through the air, hardly touching the ground with their feet, till suddenly, just as Alice was getting quite exhausted, they stopped and she found herself sitting on the ground, breathless and giddy. The queen propped her up against a tree and said kindly, "'You may rest a little now.' Alice looked round her in great surprise. "'Why, I do believe we've been under this tree the whole time. Everything's just as it was.' "'Well, of course it is,' said the queen. "'What would you have it?' "'Well, in our country,' said Alice, still panting a little. You'd generally get somewhere else if you ran very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. Hmm. A slow sort of country, said the Queen. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get anywhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. Oh, I'd rather not try, please said Alice. I'm quite content to stay here, only I am so hot and thirsty. I know what you'd like, the queen said good-naturedly, taking a little box out of her pocket. Have a biscuit? Alice thought it would not be civil to say no, though it wasn't at all what she wanted, so she took it and ate it as well as she could. And it was very dry and she thought she had never been so nearly choked in all her life. "'While you're refreshing yourself,' said the queen, "'I'll just take the measurements.' And she took a ribbon out of her pocket, marked in inches, and began measuring the ground, and sticking little pegs in here and there. "'At the end of two yards,' she said, putting in a peg to mark the distance, "'I shall give you your directions. Have another biscuit?' "'No.' Thank you, said Alice. One's quite enough. Thirst quenched, I hope, said the queen. Alice did not know what to say to this, but luckily the queen did not wait for an answer, but went on. At the end of three yards, I shall repeat them, for fear of your forgetting them. At the end of four, I shall say goodbye. At the end of five, I shall go. She had got all the pegs put in by this time, and Alice looked on with great interest as she returned to the tree, 
and then began slowly walking down the row. At the two-yard peg, she faced round and said, A pawn goes two squares in its first move, you know, so you'll go very quickly through the third square, by a railway, I should think, and you'll find yourself in the fourth square in no time. Well, that square belongs to Tweedledum and Tweedledee. The fifth is mostly water. The sixth belongs to Humpty Dumpty. But you make no remark. I... I didn't know I had to make one, just then. Alice faltered out. You should have said, said the Queen. The Queen went on in a tone of grave reproof. It's extremely kind of you to tell me all of this. However, we'll suppose it said, the seventh square is all forest, however, over one of the knights will show you the way, and in the eighth square we shall be queens together, and it's all feasting and fun. Alice got up and curtsied, and sat down again. At the next peg the queen returned again, and this time she said, Speak in French when you can't think of the English for a thing. Turn out your toes when you walk, and remember who you are. She did not wait for Alice to curtsy this time, but walked on quickly to the next peg, where she turned for a moment to say goodbye, and then hurried on to the last. How it happened, Alice never knew, but exactly as she came to the last peg, she was gone. Whether she vanished into the air, or whether she ran quickly into the wood, and she can run very fast, thought Alice. There was no way of guessing, but she was gone, and Alice began to remember that she was a pawn, and that it would soon be time for her to move. End of chapter two. Okay, so, I feel like so much happens in these chapters. Like, this book isn't super, super long, but each chapter is so packed with what's going on. So Alice goes outside, and she's trying so hard to get to the top of the hill, but she, everywhere, every which way she turns, the path always leads her back to the house. And she's getting frustrated. And she comes upon some flowers, and the flowers think that she's a flower that can just, like, move around. And the flowers are, like kind of mean and judgmental <laughs> but they're all talking and the tiger lily is like the it seems like she's like the head flower and she's like oh, silence all of you you idiots and like whatever else but it comes out that there is another flower just like alice who's been roaming around and she's red and she has thorns on her head and alice is like oh i want to meet this one where should i go and they point the way and alice is like i'm gonna go in the opposite way so alice goes the opposite way and comes across the red queen and the red queen has grown she's no longer just a little a little chess piece she's about a foot taller than alice is and they are chatting, and Alice is um, looking out and notices that the whole world looks like one massive chessboard. And so they're running and running and running and running so, so fast, and they are in the same place. They didn't go anywhere. Nothing at all. And Alice was just like, oh, I do wish that I was a queen. Like, I would be okay. Like, I just want to play chess, but... Um, it would be cool. Like, I would even be a pawn, blah, blah, blah. And the queen is like, oh okay. And so she's measuring things out and putting pegs in the ground, and she gives Alice these rules, like, in this square this is going to happen, in this square this is going to happen, in this square, blah blah blah, and when you get to the eighth square, you're going to be a queen. Um, and then she also is like, all right, go along these pegs, like, when you get to this certain peg, like, I'm going to repeat it, when you get to this peg, I'm going to be gone, and when you get to this peg, you'll be off. And so Alice is moving along, and then she looks back, and the queen is gone. Nowhere to be seen. And so now, Alice is about to venture out. And we shall see what this game of chess is going to bring us. Chapter 3. Looking Glass Insects. Oh. <laughs> oh my. Of course, the first thing to do was to make a grand survey of the country she was going to travel through. It's something very like learning geography, 
thought Alice, as she stood on tiptoe in hopes of being able to see a little further. Principal rivers? There are none. Principal mountains? I'm on the only one, but I don't think it's got any name. Principal towns? Why? What are those creatures making honey down there? They can't be bees. Nobody ever saw bees a mile off, you know. And for some time she stood silent, watching one of them that was bustling about among the flowers, poking its proboscis into them, just as if it were a regular bee, thought Alice. However, this was nothing but a regular bee. In fact, it was an elephant, as Alice soon found out, though the idea quite took her breath away at first. And what enormous flowers they must be, was her next idea. Something like cottages with the roofs taken off and stalks put to them, and what quantities of honey they must make. I think I'll go down and—no, I won't go just yet, she went on, checking herself just as she was beginning to run down the hill and trying to find some excuse for turning shy so suddenly. I'll never do— It'll never do to go down among them without a good long branch to brush them away. And what fun it'll be when they ask me how I liked my walk. I shall say, oh, I liked it very well. There came the favorite little toss of the head. Only it's so dusty and hot, and the elephants did tease so. I think I'll go down the other way, she said after a pause. And perhaps I may visit the elephants later on. Besides, I do so want to get to the third square. So this was so with this excuse, she ran down the hill and jumped over the first of the six little brooks. Tickets, please, said the guard, putting his head in the window. In a moment, everybody was holding out a ticket. They were about the same size as the people and quite seemed to fill the carriage. "'Now then, show your ticket, child,' the guard went on, looking angrily at Alice, and a great many voices all said together, like like the chorus of a song, thought, thought Alice. "'Don't keep him waiting, child. Why, his time is worth a thousand pounds a minute.' "'Well, I'm afraid I haven't got one,' Alice said in a frightened tone. "'There wasn't a ticket office where I came from.' And again the chorus of voices went on. There wasn't room for one where she came from. The land there is worth a thousand pounds an inch. Don't make excuses, said the guard. You should have bought one from the engine driver. And once more the chorus of voices went on with the man that drives the engine. Why, the smoke alone is worth a thousand pounds a puff. Alice thought to herself, then there's no use in speaking. The voices didn't join in this time, as she hadn't spoken, but, to her great surprise, they all thought in chorus. I hope you understand that thinking in chorus means, for I must confess, that I don't. Better say nothing at all. Language is worth a thousand pounds a word. I shall dream about a thousand pounds tonight. I know I shall, thought Alice. All this time the guard was looking at her first through a telescope, then through a mi microscope, and then through an opera glass. At last, he said, you're traveling the wrong way, and shut up the window and went away. So young a child, said the gentleman sitting opposite to her. He was dressed in white paper, thought to know which way she was going, even if she doesn't know her by name. A goat, that was sitting next to the gentleman in white, shut his eyes and said in a loud voice, She ought to know her way to the ticket office, even if she doesn't know her alphabet. There was a beetle sitting next to the goat. It was a very odd carriage full of passengers altogether, and, as the rule seemed to be that they should all speak in turn, he went on with, She'll have to go back from here as luggage. Alice couldn't see who was sitting behind the beetle, but a hoarse voice spoke next. "'Change engines,' it said, and there it choked and was obliged to leave off. "'Sounded like a horse,' Alice thought to herself. And in an extremely small voice, close to her ear, said, "'You might make a joke on that. Something about horse and horse.
horse, you know. Get it? Horse. And horse. <laughs> oh, there is a picture before we uh, turn the page of Alice sitting in a train car with a guy with a paper hat. And then I'm guessing that that's the conductor. Or not the conductor, the guard. Me thinks. Then a very gentle voice in the distance said, She must be labeled lass with care, you know. And after that other voice went on, What a number of people there are in the carriage, thought Alice, saying, She must by go by post, as she's got a head on her. She must be sent as a message by the telegraph. She must be the she must draw the train herself the rest of the way, and so on, and so on. Okay, and the phrase she's got a head on her, there's a note and it says reference to the head of Queen Victoria, whose portrait appears on postage stamps. But the gentleman dressed in white paper leaned forwards and whispered in her ear, Never mind what they all say my dear, but take a return ticket every time the train stops. Indeed, I shan't, Alice said rather impatiently. I don't belong to this railway journey at all. I was in a wood just now, and I wish I could get back there. You might make a joke on that, said the little voice close to her ear. Something about you would if you could, you know. Don't tease so said Alice, looking about in vain to see where the voice came from. If you're so anxious to have a joke made, why don't you make one yourself? The little voice sighed deeply. It was very unhappy, evidently, and Alice would have said something pitying to comfort it, if it would only sigh like other people, she thought. But that was, was such a wonderfully small sigh. But she couldn't have heard it at all if it hadn't come quite close to her ear. The consequence of it was that it tickled her ear very much, and quite took off her thoughts from the unhappiness of the poor little creature. "'I know you are a friend,' the little voice went on. "'A dear friend, and an old friend, and he won't hurt me, though I am an insect.' "'What kind of insect?' Alice inquired a little anxiously. What she really wanted to know was whether it could sting or not, but she thought it wouldn't be quite a civil question to ask. What? Then you don't? The little voice began, when it was drowned by a shrill scream from the engine, and everybody jumped up in alarm, Alice among the rest. The horse had put... The horse who had put his head out of the window quietly drew it in and said, it's only a brook we have to jump over. Seems everybody's satisfied with this, though Alice felt a little... Oh, <laughs> that was not a full quote. <laughs> it's only a brook we have to jump over. Everybody seemed satisfied with this, though Alice felt a little nervous at the idea of trains jumping at all. However, it'll take us into the fourth square. That's some comfort, she said to herself. In another moment, she felt the carriage rise straight up into the air, and in her fright, she caught at the thing nearest to her hand, which happened to be the goat's beard. But the beard seemed to melt away as she touched it, and she found herself sitting quietly under some tree, while the gnat, for that was the insect she had been talking to, was balancing itself on a twig just over her head and fanning her with its wings. It certainly was a very large gnat, about the size of a chicken, Alice thought. Still, she couldn't feel nervous with it, after they had been talking together so long. Then you don't like all insects, the gnat went on, as quietly as if nothing had happened. Oh, I like them when they talk, Alice said. None of them ever talk where I come from. What sort of insects do you rejoice in, where you come from? the gnat inquired. I don't rejoice in insects at all, Alex explained, because I'm rather afraid of them, at least the large kinds. 
but I can tell you the names of some of them. Of course, they answer to their names, the gnat remarked carelessly. I never knew them to do it. What's the use of their having names, the gnat said, if they won't answer to them? No use to them, said Alice, but it's useful to the people that name them, I suppose. If not, why do things have names at all? I can't say, the gnat replied. Further on, in the wood down there, they've got no names. However, go on with your list of insects. You're wasting time. Well, there's the horse fly. Alice began counting off the names on her finger. All right, said the gnat. Halfway up that bush, you'll see a rocking horse fly, if you look. It's made entirely of wood, and gets about by swinging itself from branch to branch. What does it live on? Alice asked with great curiosity. Sap and sawdust, said the gnat. Go on with the list. Alice looked at the rocking horse fly with great interest, and made up her mind that it must have been just repainted. It looked so bright and sticky. And then she went on. And then there's the dragonfly. Look on the branch above your head, said the gnat, and there you'll find the snap dragonfly. Its body is made of plum pudding, its wings of holly leaves, and its head is a raisin burning in brandy. And what does it live on? Alice asked as before. Fermenty and mince pie, the gnat replied, and it makes the nest in a Christmas box. And there is a note after fermenty, and it says a dessert made with sugar, raisins, and boiled wheat. Well, and then there's the butterfly, Alice went on, after she had taken a good look at the insect with its head on fire, and had thought to herself, I wonder if that's the reason insects are so fond of flying into candles, because they want to turn into snapdragon flies. Crawling at your feet, said the gnat. Alice drew her feet back in some alarm. You may observe a bread and butter fly. Its wings are thin slices of bread and butter. Its body is a crust, and its head is a lump of sugar. And what does it live on? Weak tea with cream in it. A new difficulty came into Alice's head. Supposing it couldn't find any, she suggested. Then it would die, of course. But that must happen very often, Alice remarked thoughtfully. It always happens, said the gnat. After this, Alice was silent for a minute or two, pondering. The gnat amused itself meanwhile by humming round and round her head. At last it settled again and remarked, I suppose you don't want to lose your name? No, indeed, Alice said a little anxiously. And yet, I don't know, the gnat went on in a careless tone. Only think how convenient it would be if you could manage to go home without it. For instance, if the governess wanted to go to call you to your lesson, she would call out, Come here, and there she would have to leave off, because there wouldn't be a name for her to call. And, of course, you wouldn't have to go, you know. And we have two pictures. We have the horse, the rocking horse fly, and the snap dragonfly. A beautiful, a beautiful. That would never do, I'm sure, said Alice. The governess would never think of excusing me lessons for that. If she couldn't remember my name, she'd call me Miss, as the servants do. Well, if she said Miss, and didn't say anything more, the gnat remarked, of course you'd miss your lessons. That's a joke. I wish you had made it. Why do you wish I had made it? Alice said. It's a very bad one. But the gnat only sighed deeply, while two large tears came rolling down its cheeks. You shouldn't make jokes, Alice said, if it makes you so unhappy. Then came another of those melancholy little sighs, and this time the poor gnat really seemed to have sighed itself away, for when Alice looked up, there was nothing whatever to be seen on the twig, and, as she was getting quite chilly with sitting still so long, she got up and walked on.
she very soon came to an open field with a wood on the other side of it. It looked much darker than the last wood, and Alice felt a little timid about going into it. However, on second thoughts, she made up her mind to go on. For I certainly won't go back, she thought to herself, and this was the only way to the eighth square. This must be the wood, she said thoughtfully to herself, where things have no names. I wonder what'll become of my name when I go in. I shouldn't like to lose it at all, because they'd have to give me another, and it would be almost certain to be an ugly one. But then the fun would be trying to find the creature that had got my old name. That's just like the advertisements, you know, when people lose dogs, answers to the name of Dash, and on a brass collar, just fancy calling everyone you met Alice, till one of them answered. Only they wouldn't answer at all, if they were wise. She was rambling on in this way when she reached the wood. It looked very cool and shady. Well, at any rate, it's a great comfort, she said as she stepped under the trees, after being so hot to get into the... into the... into the what? She went on, rather surprised at not being able to think of the word. I mean, to get under the, under the, under this, you know? Putting her hand on the trunk of the tree. What does it call itself, I wonder? I do believe it's got no name. Why, to be sure it hasn't. She stood silent for a minute, thinking, and then she suddenly began again. Then it really has happened, after all. And now, who am I? I will remember, if I can. I'm determined to do it. But being determined didn't help her much, and all she could say after a great deal of puzzling was, L. I know it starts with L. Just then, a fawn came wandering by. It looked at Alice with its large, gentle eyes, but didn't seem at all frightened. Here. Here, then. Here, then. Alice said as she held on, held out her hand and tried to stroke it, but it only started back a little, and then stood looking at her again. "'What do you call yourself?' the fawn said at last, such a soft, sweet voice it had. "'Oh, I wish I knew,' thought poor Alice. She answered rather sadly, "'Nothing, just now.' "'Oh, think again,' it said. "'That won't do.' Alice thought, but nothing came of it. Please, won't you tell me what you call yourself? She said timidly. I think that might help a little. Oh, I'll tell you, if you'll come a little further on, the fawn said. I can't remember here. So they walked on together through the wood, Alice with her arms clasped lovingly round the soft cheek of the fawn, till they came out into the open field and here the fawn gave a sudden bound into the air and shook itself free of Alice's arms. "'I'm a fawn!' it cried out in a voice of delight. "'And dear me, you're a human child!' A sudden look of alarm came into its beautiful brown eyes, and in another moment it had darted away at full speed. So there is a picture back here of the gnat. And then we do have a picture of Alice and the fawn, which now they know their names because they're not in that that place of no names. Alice stood looking after it, almost ready to cry with vexation at having lost her dear little fellow traveler so suddenly. However, I know my name now, she said. It's some comfort. Alice. Alice, I won't forget it again. And now— which of those finger-posts ought I to follow, I wonder? It was not a very difficult question to answer, as there was only one road through the wood, and the two finger-posts both pointed along it. I'll settle it, Alice said to herself, when the road divides and they point different ways. But this did not seem likely to happen. She went on and on a long way, but wherever the road divided, there were sure to be two finger-posts pointing the same way, one marked to Tweedledum's house, and the other to the house of Tweedledee. 
Oh, I do believe, said Alice at last, that they live in the same house. I wonder I never thought of that before, but I can't stay there long. I'll just call and say, how do you do, and ask them the same out of the wood, if I could only get to the eighth square before it gets dark. So she wandered on, talking to herself as she went, till on turning a sharp corner she came upon two fat little men, so suddenly that she could not help starting back, but in another moment she recovered herself, feeling sure that they must be. End. And then the next chapter starts Tweedledee, or Tweedledum Tweedledee. End of chapter three. Okay, so this chapter, Alice is on a train, and she doesn't have a ticket, and she um, doesn't really know where she's going. She She's just like, oh man, I think this is going to take me to the next square that I need to be, but I don't really know. And it's just full of insects. There's so many bugs in here. And there's like a goat in here and there's a horse in here who has a horse voice. And there's a gnat. And this gnat is so... I love this little gnat. Every time there's like a pun or like a little slight that the gnat like perceives is just like whispering to Alice like, hey, you should say this because it's funny. <laughs> but then he like starts to cry and I think that's hilarious. Um, and then we get like little puns like a, ho a rocking horse fly and a snap dragon fly and all of these things. And I just think it's so, so great. And then we go to the forest with no name. Is it a forest? It's woods. We're in the woods and there's just no names. <laughs> Alice can't remember her name and she's like, I think it starts with an L? Maybe? I know it starts with an L. And she comes a a upon a creature and she, the, fa the fawn, doesn't know what it is either or its name and it's like, well, I can't do it here, but maybe come over this way. <laughs> so then they go a little bit further out and the fawn is like, oh, I'm a fawn and you're a human child. And Alice is like, yeah, my name is Alice and I'm never going to forget my name. Got it. And now Alice is following um, two paths and she's like determined to just make her decision once they diverge. But one path says to Tweedledum's house and the other is to the house of Tweedledee and they're going the same way. And she's like, I think they live in the same house. <laughs> so now we're going to get some Tweedledee and Tweedledum action in here. Chapter four, Tweedledum and Tweedledee. They were standing under a tree, each with an arm round the other's neck. And Alice knew which was which in a moment, because one of them had dumb embroidered on his collar and the other had D. I suppose they've each got Tweedle round at the back of the collar, she said to herself. They stood so still that she quite forgot they were alive, and she was just looking round to see if the word Tweedle was written on the back of each collar, when she was startled by a voice coming from the one marked dumb. If you think we're waxworks, he said, you ought to pay, you know. Waxworks weren't made to be looked at for nothing, no how. Contrary wise, said the one marked D, if you think we're alive, you ought to speak. Oh, I'm sure I'm very sorry, was all Alice could say, for the words of the old song kept ringing through her head like the ticking of a clock, and she could hardly keep saying them out loud. Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle. For Tweedledum said Tweedledee had spoiled his nice new rattle. Just then flew down a monstrous crow, as black as a tar barrel, which frightened both the heroes so they quite forgot their quarrel. <laughs> I know what you're thinking about, said Tweedledum, but it isn't so no how. Contrary wise, continued Tweedledee, if it were so, it might be. And if it were so, it would be. But if it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. I was thinking, Alice said very politely, 
Which is the best way out of this wood? It's getting so dark. Would you tell me, please? But the fat little men only looked at each other and grinned. They looked so exactly like a couple of great schoolboys that Alice couldn't help pointing her finger at Tweedledum and saying, First boy! No how, Tweedledum cried out briskly and shut up his mouth, but it again with a snap. Next boy, said Alice, passing on to Tweedledee, though she felt quite certain she would only shout out, he would only shout out, contrarywise, and so he did. <laughs> You've begun wrong, cried Tweedledum. The first thing is a visit. In a visit is to say how do you do and shake hands. And here the two brothers gave each other a hug, and then they held out the two hands that were free to shake hands with her. Alice did not like shaking hands with them at first, for fear of hurting the other one's feelings, so... As the best way out of the difficulty, she took hold of both hands at once. The next moment they were dancing round in a ring. This seemed quite natural, she remembered afterwards, and she was not even surprised to hear music playing. It seemed to come from the tree under which they were dancing, and it was done, as well as she could make it out, by the branches rubbing one against the other like fiddles and fiddlesticks. was certainly very funny, said Alice afterwards, when she was telling her sister the history of it all, to find myself singing, Here we go round the mulberry bush. I don't know when I began it, but somehow I felt as if I'd been singing it all long, long time. The other two dancers were fat and very soon out of breath. Four times round is enough for one dance, Tweedledum panted out, and they left off dancing as suddenly as they had begun. The music stopped at the same moment. Then they let go of Alice's hands and stood looking at her for a minute. There was a rather awkward pause, as Alice didn't know how to begin a conversation with people she had just been dancing with. "'It would never do to say, how'd you do now?' she said to herself. "'We seem to have got beyond that somehow.' "'I hope you're not much tired,' she said at last. "'No how. And thank you very much for asking, said Tweedledum. So much obliged, said, added Tweedledee. Do you like poetry? Yes, pretty well, some poetry, Alice said doubtfully. Would you tell me which road leads out of the woods? What shall I repeat to her, said Tweedledee, looking round at Tweedledum with great solemn eyes and not noticing Alice's questions. The walrus and the carpenter is the longest, Tweedledum replied, giving his brother an affectionate hug. Tweedledum began instantly. The sun was shining. Here Alice ventured to interrupt him. If it's very long, she said as politely as she could, would you please tell me first which road? Tweedledee smiled gently and began. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all its might. He did not, he did his very best to make the billions smooth and bright, and this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The sun was shining sulkily because she thought the sun hadn't got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be. The sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead. There were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see, such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. O oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk, along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. 
And this was odd because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four oysters followed them, and yet another four. And thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more. All hopin', all hoppin' through the frothy waves and scramblin' to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock conveniently low. And all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the war said, to walk, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath, and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar besides are very good indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. Before I turn the page, there is the oyster, or not the oyster, the, um, who is this? <laughs> oh, the carpenter, the carpenter and the walrus. <laughs> I was like, who are you? But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing but cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I've had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick. After we've brought them out so far, and made them trot so quick, the carpenter said nothing but the butter's spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter. You've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came there none. And this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one. I like the walrus best, said Alice, because you see, he was a little sorry for the poor, poor oysters. He ate more than the carpenter, though, said Tweedledee. You see, he held his handkerchief in front so that the carpenter wouldn't count how many he took, contrary-wise. Well, that was mean, Alice said indignantly. Then I like the carpenter best, if he didn't eat so many as the walrus. But he ate as many as he could get, said Tweedledum. This was a puzzler. After a pause, Atlas began. Well, they were both very unpleasant characters. Here she checked herself in some, with, in some alarm at hearing something that sounded to her like the puffing of a large steam engine in the wood near them though she feared it was more likely to be a wild beast. "'Are there any lions or tigers about here?' she asked timidly. "'There are pictures!' It's the carpenter and the walrus and all the little oysters. And there they go. <laughs> "'It's only the Red King snoring,' said Tweedledee. "'Come and look at him,' the brothers cried. And they each took out, took one of Alice's hands and led her up to where the king was sleeping. Isn't he a lovely sight? said Tweedledum. Alice couldn't say honestly that he was. He had a tall, red nightcap on with a tassel, and he was lying crumpled up into a sort of untidy heap and snoring loud. Fit to snore his head off, said Tweedledum, remar as Tweedledum remarked. I'm sure he'll catch cold with lying on the damp grass said Alice, who was a very thoughtful little girl. He's dreaming now, said Tweedledee. And what do you think he's dreaming about? Alice said. Nobody can guess that. Why about you? Tweedledee exclaimed, clapping his hands triumphantly. And if he left off dreaming about you, where do you suppose you'd be? Where I am now, of course, said Alice. Not you, Tw Tweedledee retorted contemptuously. You'd be nowhere. Why? You'd only a sort of thing in his dream. If that their king was to wake, added Tweedledum, you'd go out, bang, just like a candle. Oh, I shouldn't, Alice exclaimed indignantly. Besides, if I'm only a sort of thing in his dream, what are you? I should like to know. Ditto, said Tweedledum. Ditto, ditto, cried Tweedledee. 
He shouted this so loud that Alice couldn't help saying, Hush! You'll be waking him, I'm afraid, if you make so much noise. Well, it's no use your talking about waking him, said Tweedledum, when you're only one of the things in his dream. You know very well you're not real. Why, well, I'm real, said Alice, and began to cry. You won't make yourself a bit realer by crying, Tweedledee remarked. There's nothing to cry about. If I wasn't real, Alice said, half laughing through her tears, it all seemed so ridiculous. I shouldn't be able to cry. I suppose you don't suppose those are real tears, Tweedledum interrupted in a tone of great contempt. There is the king sleeping, and there is Alice and one of the Tweedles. I don't know which one. It doesn't say. Oh, wait, it's dumb. This Tweedledum. <laughs> I know you're talking nonsense, Alice thought to herself, and it's foolish to cry about it. So she brushed away her tears and went on as cheerily as she could. At any rate, I'd better be getting out of the wood, for really it's coming on very dark. Do you think it's going to rain? Tweedledum spread a large umbrella over himself and his brother and looked up at it. No, I don't think it is, he said. At least, not under here, no how. But it may rain outside. It may, if it chooses, said Tweedledee. We've no objection, contrariwise. Selfish things, Alice, and she was just going to say good night and leave them when Tweedledum sprang out from under the umbrella and seized her by the wrist. Do you see that? he said in a voice choking with passion, and his eyes grew large and yellow all in a moment, as he pointed with a trembling finger at a small white thing lying under the tree. It's only a rattle, Alice said after a careful examination of the little white thing. Not a rattle snake, you know, she added hastily, thinking that he was frightened. Only an old rattle, quite old and broken. I know what it was, cried Tweedledum, beginning to stamp about wildly and tear his hair. It's spoilt, of course. Here he looked at Tweedledee, who immediately sat down on the ground and tried to hide himself under the umbrella. Alice laid her hand upon his arm and said in a soothing tone, You needn't be so angry about an old rattle. But it isn't old, Tweedledum cried in a far in a greater fury than ever. It's new, I tell you. I bought it yesterday, my nice new rattle and his voice rose to a perfect scream. At this time, Tweedledee was trying his best to fold up the umbrella, with himself in it, which was such an extraordinary thing to do, that it quite took off Alice's attention from the angry brother. But he couldn't quite succeed, and it ended in his rolling over, bundled up in the umbrella, with only his head out, and there he lay, opening and shutting his mouth and his large eyes, Looking more like a fish than anything else, thought Alice. Of course you agree to have a battle, Tweedledum said in a calmer tone. I suppose so, the other sulkily replied, and he crawled out of the umbrella. Only she must help us to dress up, you know. So the two brothers went off hand in hand into the wood, and returned in a minute with their arms full of things, such as bolsters, blankets, hearth rugs, tablecloths, disc covers, and coal scuttles. "'I hope you're a good hand at pinning and tying strings,' Tweedledum remarked. "'Every one of these things has got to go on, somehow or other.' Alice said afterwards she had never seen such a fuss made about anything in her life, the way those two bustled about, and the quantity of things they put on and the trouble they gave her in tying strings and fastening buttons. Really, they'd be more like bundles of old clothes than anything else by the time they're ready, she said to herself, as she arranged a bolster round the neck of Tweedledee. To keep his head from being cut off, she said. You know, he added very gravely, it's one of the most serious things that can possibly happen to one in a battle, to get one's head cut off. Alice laughed aloud, but she managed to turn it into a cough for fear of hurting his feelings. "'Do I look very pale?' said Tweedledum, coming up to have his helmet tied on. He called it a helmet, though it certainly looked much more like a saucepan. "'Well, yes, a little,' Alice replied gently. "'I'm very brave, generally,' he went on in a low voice. "'Only today I happen to have a headache.' "'And I've got a toothache,' 
said Tweedledee, who had overheard the remark. I'm far worse than you. Then you'd better not fight today, said Alice, thinking it a good opportunity to make peace. We must have a bit of a fight, but I don't care about going on long, said Tweedledum. What's the time now? Tweedledee looked at his watch and said, half past four. Let's fight till six and then have dinner, said Tweedledum. Very well, said the other, rather sadly. And she can watch us, only you'd better not come very close, he added. I generally hit everything I can see when I get real excited. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I also generally hit everything I can see when I get excited. And I hit everything within reach, cried Tweedledum, whether I can see it or not. <laughs> Alice laughed. You must hit the trees pretty often, I should think, she said. Tweedledum looked round him with a satisfied smile. I don't suppose, he said, there'll be a tree left standing for ever so far round by the time we've finished. And all about a rattle, said Alice, still hoping to make them a little ashamed of fighting for such a trifle. I shouldn't have minded it so much said Tweedledum, if it hadn't been a new one. Oh, I wish the monstrous crow would come, thought Alice. There's only one sword, you know, Tweedledum said to his brother, but you can have the umbrella. It's quite as sharp. <laughs> only we must be... Only we... Only we must begin quick. It's getting as dark as it can. And darker, said Tweedledee. It was getting dark so suddenly that Alice thought there must be a thunderstorm coming on. What a thick black cloud that is, she said, and how fast it comes. Why, I don't believe it got, I do believe it's got wings. It's the crow, Tweedledum cried out in a shrill voice of alarm, and the two brothers took to their heels and were out of sight in a moment. Alice ran a little way into the wood and stopped under a large tree. It can never get at me here, she thought. It's far too large to squeeze itself in among the trees. But I wish it wouldn't flap its wings so. It makes quite a hurricane in the wood. Here's somebody's big... Here's somebody's shawl being blown away. <laughs> and that is the end of chapter four. All right. Chapter four is all about Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And they are apparently Irish. <laughs> they are apparently Irish and great. Um, so they tell a tale about the, uh, carpenter and the walrus eating oysters and the oysters are like, no, don't eat me. But they're like convinced that everything is fine. Um, and then they see a big rattle and they have to fight over it. And this whole time, Alice, every once in a while is like, okay, but like, how do I get out of the woods? Like, I will gladly listen to your recitation, but can you tell me how to get out of the woods? And they're just m moving on like they don't hear her. And so now Alice has helped them get all dressed and ready to have a fight. <laughs> and uh, then a big cloud comes over, but really it's a crow. And that's where we've ended. So have a little sip. Let's do it. Chapter 5. Wool and Water She caught the shawl as she spoke, and looked about for the owner. In another moment, the White Queen came running wildly through the wood, with both arms stretched out wide as if she were flying, and Alice very civilly went to meet her with the shawl. Oh, I'm very glad I happened to be in the way. Alice said, as she helped her to put on her shawl again. The White Queen only looked at her in a helpless, frightening sort of way, and kept repeating something in a whisper to herself that sounded like, bread and butter, bread and butter. And Alice felt that if there were to be any conversation at all, she must manage it herself. So she began rather timidly, Am I addressing the White Queen? Well, Yes, if you call that addressing, the queen said. It isn't my notion of the thing at all. Alice thought it would never do to have an argument at the very beginning of their conversation, so she smiled and said, If your majesty would only tell me the right way to begin, I'll do it as well as I can. Oh, but I don't want it done at all, 
groaned the poor queen. I've been addressing myself for the last two years, or for the last two hours. It would have been all the better, as it seemed to Alice, if she had got someone else to dress her. She was so dreadfully untidy. Every single thing is crooked, Alice thought to herself, and she's all over pins. May I put your shawl on straight for you? she added aloud. I don't know what's the matter with it, the queen said in a melancholy voice. It's out of temper, I think. I've pinned it here, and I've pinned it there, but there's no pleasing it. Well, it can't go straight, you know, if you pin it all on one side. Alice said, as she gently put it right for her, and, dear me, what a state your hair is in! The brush got, has got tangled in it, the queen said with a sigh, and I lost the comb yesterday. Alice carefully released the brush and did her best to get the hair into order. Come, you look rather better now, she said, after altering most of the pins, but really, you should have got a maid, a lady's maid. I'm sure I'll take you with I'm sure I'll take you with pleasure, the queen said, two pence a week, and jam every other day. Alice couldn't help laughing as she said it. I don't want you to hire me, and I don't care for jam. It's a very good jam, said the queen. Well, I don't want any today, at any rate. You couldn't have it if you did want it the queen said. The rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. Well, it must come sometimes to jam today, Alice objected. No, it can't, said the queen. It's jam every other day. Today isn't other day, you know. Well, I don't understand, said Alice. It's dreadfully confusing. That's the effect of living backwards, the queen said kindly. It always makes one a little giddy first. Living backward, Alice repeated in great astonishment. I've never heard of such a thing. Oh, I forgot to show you the picture of Alice redressing the queen. <laughs> but there's one great advantage in it, that one's memory works both ways. Well, I'm sure mine only works one way, Alice remarked. I can't remember things before they happen. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, the queen remarked. What sort of thing do you remember best? Alice ventured to ask. Oh, things that happen the week after next, the queen replied in a careless tone. For instance, now. And she went on sticking a large piece of plaster on her finger as she spoke. There's the king's messenger. He's in prison now, being punished, and the trial doesn't even begin till next Wednesday, and of course the crime comes last of all. Suppose he never commits the crime, said Alice. That would be all the better, wouldn't it? The queen said, as she bound the plaster round her finger with a bit of ribbon. Alice felt there was no denying that. Well, of course it would be all the better, she said. But it wouldn't be all the better, his being punished. You're wrong there, at any rate, said the queen. You were ever punished? Were you ever punished? Only for faults, said Alice. And you were all the better for it, I know, the queen said triumphantly. Yes, but then I had done the things I was punished for, said Alice. That makes all the difference. But if you hadn't done them, the queen said, that would have been better still, better and better and better. Her voice went higher with each better. Oh, my voice did not go higher. It went lower, in fact. <laughs> better and better and better. Her voice went higher with each better, till it got quite to a squeak at the last. Alice was just beginning to say, there's a mistake somewhere, when the queen began screaming so loud that she had to leave the sentence unfinished. The queen, shaking her head, hand about as if she wanted to shake it off. My fingers bleeding! Oh! Oh! Her screams were so exactly like the whistle of a steam engine that Alice had to hold both her hands over her ears. What is the matter? 
she said, as soon as there was a chance of making herself heard. Have you pricked your finger? I haven't pricked it yet, the queen said, but I soon shall. Oh! Well, when do you expect to do it? Alice asked, feeling very much inclined to laugh. When I fasten my shawl again, the poor queen groaned out, the brooch will come undone directly. Oh! As she said the words, the brooch flew open, and the queen clutched wildly at it and tried to clasp it. Take care, cried Alice, you're holding it all crooked. And as she caught the brooch, but it was too late, the pin had slipped, and the queen had pricked her finger. That accounts for the bleeding, you see. That accounts for the bleeding, you see, she said to Alice with a smile. Now you understand the way things happen here. But why don't you scream now? Alice asked, holding her hands, ready to put over her ears again. Why, I've done all the screaming already, said the queen. What would be the good of having it all over again. By this time it was getting light. The crow must have flown away, I think, said Alice. I'm so glad it's gone. I thought it was the night coming. I wish I could manage to be glad, the queen said. Only, I can never remember the rule. You must be very happy living in this wood and being very glad wherever you like. Only it is so very lonely here said Alice in a melancholy voice, and at the thought of her loneliness two large tears came rolling down her cheeks. "'Oh, don't go on like that,' cried the poor queen, wringing her hands in despair. "'Consider what a great girl you are. Consider what a long way you've come today. Consider what a clock it is. Consider anything, only don't cry.' Alice could not help laughing at this, even in the midst of her tears. "'Can you keep from crying by considering these things?' she asked. "'That's the way it's done,' said the queen with great decision. "'Nobody can do two things at once, you know. "'Let's consider your age to begin with. "'How old are you?' "'I'm seven and a half, exactly.' "'You needn't say exactly,' the queen remarked. "'I can believe it without that. "'I'll give you—now I'll, now I'll give you something to believe.' I'm just one hundred and one, five months and a day. Well, I can't believe that, said Alice. Can't you? The queen said in a pitying tone. Try again. Draw a long breath and shut your eyes. Alice laughed. There's no use in trying, she said. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Oh, there goes the shawl again. The brooch had come undone as she spoke, and a sudden gust of wind blew the queen's shawl back across the brook. The queen spread out her arms again and went flying after it, and this time she succeeded in catching it for herself. I've got it, she cried in a triumphant tone. Now you see. Now— you shall see me pin it on again, all by myself. Then I hope your finger is better now, Alice said very politely as she crossed the little brook after the queen. Oh, much better, cried the queen, her voice rising into a squeak as she went on. Much better? 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 The last word ended in a long bleat, so like a sheep that Alice quite started. She looked at the queen, who seemed to have suddenly wrapped herself in wool. Alice rubbed her eyes and looked again. She couldn't make out what had happened at all. Was she in a shop? And was that really, was it really a sheep that was sitting on the other side of the counter? Rub as she could, she could make nothing more of it. She was in a little dark shop, leaning with her elbows on the counter, and opposite to her was an old sheep sitting in an armchair knitting, and every now and then leaving off to look at her through a great pair of spectacles. "'What is it you want to buy?' the sheep said at last, looking up for a moment from her knitting. "'I don't quite know yet,' said Alice very gently. "'I should like to look around me first, if I might. "'You may look in front and on both sides, if you like,' said the sheep, "'but you can't look all round you.' unless you've got eyes at the back of your head. But these 
as it happened, Alice had not got. So she contented herself with turning round, looking at the shelves as she came to them. The shop seemed to be full of all manner of curious things, but the oddest part of it all was that whenever she looked hard at any shelf to make out exactly what it had on it, that particular shelf was always quite empty, though the others round it were crowded as full as they could hold. "'Things flow about here so,' she said at last in a plaintive tone, after she had spent a minute or so in vainly pursuing a large bright thing that looked sometimes like a doll and sometimes like a work-box and was always in the shelf next, above the one she was looking at. "'And this one is the most provoking of all. But I'll tell you what,' she added, as a sudden thought struck her. "'I'll follow it up the very top of the shelf. It'll puzzle, it'll puzzle it to go through the ceiling, I expect.' But even this plan failed. The thing went through the ceiling as quietly as possible, as if it were quite used to it. Are you a child, or a, a what, or or a teetotum? And there is a note here, and it is a spinning top with numerals printed on its numerous flat surfaces. The sheep said, as she took up another pair of needles, "You'll make me giddy soon if you go on turning round like that." She was now working with fourteen pairs at once, and Alice couldn't help looking at her in great astonishment. How can she knit with so many? The, ch the puzzled child thought to herself. She gets more and more like a porcupine every minute. "'Can you row?' the sheep asked, handing her a pair of knitting needles as she spoke. "'Yes, a little, but not on land, and not with needles,' Alice was beginning to say, when suddenly the needles turned into oars into her hands, and she found they were in a little boat, gliding along between banks, so there was nothing for it but to do her best. Feather, cried the sheep, as she took up another pair of needles. This didn't sound like a remark that needed any answer, so Alice said nothing, but pulled away. There was something very odd about the water, she thought, as every now and then the oars got fast in it, and would hardly come out again. Feather, feather, the sheep cried again, taking more needles. You'll be catching a crab directly. A dear little crab, thought Alice, I should like that. Didn't you hear me say feather? The sheep cried angrily, taking up quite a bunch of needles. Indeed I did, said Alice. You've said it very often and very loud. Please, where are the crabs? In the water, of course, said the sheep, sticking some of the needles into her hair as her hands were full. Feather, I say. Why do you say feather so often? Alice asked at last, rather vexed. I'm not a bird. You are, said the sheep. You are a little goose. This offended Alice a little. So there was no more conversation for a minute or two while the boat glided gently on, sometimes among beds of weeds, which made the oars stick fast in the water, worse than ever, and sometimes under trees, but always with the same tall river banks frowning over their heads. And here's the picture with Alice and the sheep in the shop. Alice and the sheep in the shop. And then, oops, here is a picture with Alice and the sheep in the shop on a boat. <laughs> oh, please. There are some scented rushes, Alice cried in sudden transparent transport of delight. There really are, and such beauties. You needn't say please to me about them the sheep said, without looking up from her knitting. I didn't put them there, and I'm not going to take them away. No, but I meant, please, may we wait and pick some? Alice pleaded, if you don't mind stopping the boat for a minute. How am I to stop it? said the sheep. If you leave off rowing, it'll stop itself. So the boat was left to drift down the stream as it would, till it glided gently in among the waving rushes and then the little sleeves were carefully rolled up, and the little arms were plunged in elbow-deep to get hold of the rushes a good long way down before breaking them off, and for a while Alice forgot all about the sheep and the knitting, as she bent over the sides of the boat with just the ends of her tangled hair 
dipping into the water, while with bright, eager eyes she caught at one bunch after another of the darling, scented rushes. I only hope the boat won't topple over, she said to herself. Oh, what a lovely one, only I couldn't quite reach it. And it certainly did seem a little provoking, almost as if it happened on purpose, she thought, that though she managed to pick plenty of beautiful rushes as the boat glided by, there was always a more lovely one that she couldn't reach. The prettiest are always farthest, she said at last, with a sigh, at the obstinacy of the rushes in growing so far off, as with flushed cheeks and dripping hair and hands, she scrambled back into place and began to arrange her new-found treasures. What mattered it what mattered it to her just then that the rushes had begun to fade, and to lose all their scent and beauty from the very moment that she pricked them? Even real scented rushes, you know, last only a very little while, and these, being dream rushes, melted away almost like snow, as they lay in heaps at her feet. But Adlis hardly noticed this. There were so many other curious things to think about. They hadn't gone much farther before the blade of one of the oars got fast in the water and wouldn't come out again, so Alice explained it afterwards and the consequence was that the handle of it caught her under the chin, and, in spite of a series of shocks of, oh, 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 from poor Alice, it swept her straight off the seat and down among the heaps of rushes. However, she wasn't a bit hurt, and was soon up again. The sheep went on with her knitting all the while, just as if nothing had happened. That was a nice crab you caught she remarked, as Alice got back into her place, very much relieved to find herself still in the boat. "'Was it? I didn't see it,' said Alice, peeping cautiously over the side of the boat into the dark water. "'I wish it hadn't let go. I could so like a little crab to take home with me.' But the sheep only laughed scornfully and went on with her knitting. "'Are there many crabs here?' asked Alice. "'Crabs? And all sorts of things.' said the sheep. Plenty of choice. Only make up your mind. Now what do you want to buy? To buy? Alice echoed in a tone that was half astonished and half frightened, for the oars and the boat and the river had vanished all in a moment, and she was back again in the little dark shop. I should like to buy an egg, please, she said timidly. How do you sell them? Five pence farthing for one, two pence for two, the sheep replied. "'Then two are cheaper than one,' Alice said in a surprised tone, taking out her purse. "'Only you must eat them both, if you buy two,' said the sheep. "'Then I'll have one, please,' said Alice, as she put the money down on the counter, for she thought to herself, "'They mightn't be at all nice, you know.' The sheep took the money and put it away in a box. Then she said, "'I never put things into people's hands. That would never do. You must get it for yourself.' And so saying, she went off to the other end of the shop and set the egg upright on a shelf. "'I wonder why it wouldn't do,' thought Alice, as she groped her way among the tables and chairs, for the shop was very dark towards the end. "'The egg seems to get farther away the more I walk towards it. Let me see. Is this a chair? Why, it's got branches, I declare. How very odd to find trees growing here. And actually there's a little brook. Well—' This is the very oddest shop I've ever seen. So she went on, wandering more and more at every step, as everything turned into a tree the moment she came up to it, and she quite expected the egg to do the same. End of chapter five. All right, so Alice meets the queen, meets the white queen again. And she has her, her shawl. She brings it over to the queen. And the queen is just very disheveled. <laughs> just very disheveled. And she's, like, putting things on. And she's, like, wrapping herself, her, wrapping her finger in a bandage. And everything is, like, in reverse. So she's wrapping her finger in a bandage. And then she starts bleeding. And then she pricks her finger on the brooch. And that is the order. 
And she's like, oh, well, everything works that way here. Like, that guy over there is being punished. But, of course, that's before even the, the... the trial and then of course the crime is last and alice is like okay but like wouldn't wouldn't it be better if he just didn't do the crime and it's like well of course it would be better if he just didn't do the crime and so they like go back and forth with that whole discussion and then alice comes across a shop with a sheep who is knitting and that is adorable and every time alice tries to grab something or look at something it is just out of view and then somehow some way they're in a little boat and there's crabs and, and the sheep is just you know talking circles like it seems like every character does and it's great and Alice is like okay after the sheep has conti- has asked several times like okay like what do you want to buy and Alice is like I will have an egg and the sheep is like all right Do you want one egg for five or do you want two eggs for two? And Alice is like, well, it's cheaper to get two. And the sheep is like, yeah, but if you get two, you have to eat them both. And Alice is like, all right, cool. I'll get one because what if I don't like them? And the sheep is like, thank you very much. Takes the money and is like, but I don't ever get the items. Like you have to do that yourself. So Alice is going through the shop and the shop is getting darker and darker and darker. And the closer she gets to certain items, like the chair, the chair kind of just turns into a tree. And things keep turning into trees and forests. And she's hoping that the egg doesn't do that by the time that she gets there. And that is where we ended off. That last part was excellent. So that is a little over halfway. And that is going to be where we end tonight. Yay! So next time we will finish. It is great. The chapter title for the next one is... I'm not going to tell you because it's, well, no, I'll tell you. It's Humpty Dumpty. Mayhaps Humpty Dumpty is the egg that she just paid for. Maybe. We'll find out. We'll find out next time. (laughs) (sighs) Yes. Thank you all for being here so, so much. It was fun. It was a good time. (laughs) Um, We'll be back next time picking up right where we left off. We will be finishing... Um, if I don't see you next time, I hope to see you very soon. As always, whether you're lyric, whether you chat, I 1000% appreciate you. And I 1000% appreciate your support. Goodbye. <laughs>